All right, we're ready to go. And I am here. This is Madeline Charney. I'm the coordinator this year of Sustainable Roundtable, otherwise known as Sustain RT. So you can see our agenda on the screen. First, I will give some very brief updates and opportunities and what's happening at the annual conference in Orlando. And then I will turn it right over to Jeannie Sander, who will introduce Rachel Shea, and Rachel will give us her presentation. So can you go to the next slide, please? Beth, will you do that for me? I think you can go ahead and click to the next slide since you're presenter, but uh, I can take it away if you want. So quick updates. Uh, we are still seeking your feedback. You might have seen on the listserv, the ALA Task Force on the Context of Future Accreditation has asked us, how could sustainability fit into library and information science programs? You can go to our website or back to that email or talk to Rebecca Smith Aldrich. We have until the end of this month to give our feedback to that task force. The next thing is we will have a virtual meeting. This has become our practice about a week or two before the in-person meeting at our conferences. We want to give everybody an opportunity. You don't even have to be a Sustain RT member, but we will be sending out that registration information any day now. So mark your calendars for June 17th. And the next slide, please. If you are coming to ALA, we have many things happening both days, starting the morning of Saturday, Rebecca Smith Aldrich and Matthew Bowlerman, who are board members of Sustain RT, will do their wonderful workshop called Sustainable Thinking. Then join us at one o'clock for our open board meeting, and that evening we will party on down with the sustain, uh, excuse me, the social responsibilities roundtable. The next morning, we have a 10:30 sort of a lightning round, but a little bit deeper. Planting the seeds is going to be four panelists speaking for about 10 minutes each on the various exciting sustainability projects. And then finally, 4.30 that evening, we have a panel of about, I think it's five librarians coming from Aruba to talk about the, their work with their green libraries and partnering with a higher, uh, excuse me, K through 12 and even higher ed libraries all. Um, working together. So please join us uh, either virtually on the 17th or see you in Orlando. And I will now turn it over to Jeannie. Beth Silar Williams, Madeline Charney, uh, and in addition, Tracy Urbick and Arlene Hopkins. But to begin our webinar, I just want to do a brief introduction of Rachel. Uh, Rachel began working in libraries in the early 70s and has worked her way from being a cataloger, including original serials cataloging, to reference and bibliographic instruction. She's now head of public services at Clark University Libraries. She also teaches a course called Sustainability in the Sacred at Clark University's Co-Pace Division, and she'll tell us more about that. In her other life, she has completed a six-year pilgrimage in the Huichal tradition, I hope I pronounced that correctly, that took her 12 years. She'll tell us more about that, too. She's now working with uh, Tom Balistrieri, a man who teaches in the Lakota way. What she wants you to get from this uh, webinar is that every single one of us can do something right now to help build sustainability. Begin with gratitude. So, Rachel. Uh, take it away. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, first of all, I'm going to begin with giving thanks to my teachers, Wavia Kame, Don David, and Eche, and to my sacred sites. I also thank the Huichol Indians, Don Lupe, Don Jose, and the Lakota teachers, Joe Eagle Elk and Kenny Standsfast, and others who have taught my teachers. I also thank those of you who've written your comments in preceding the webinar to describe what it is you had hoped to get from this. I completely rewrote what I 
was going to say based on your comments. So thank you for your genuine and earnest interest. I have to do everything as a story. So here is my story. Um, back in 1965, let's see. Oops. Now I don't know how to get to my slides. There we go. Back in 1965, when I was in fifth grade in this very room, there was enough information for me to put together as a 10-year-old that we would be facing climate change. That language didn't exist then, but I still knew that this was going to be a problem. And I distinctly remember it because my fifth grade teacher was very angry with me for asking about it, and he didn't like to not have an answer. So when he couldn't answer me about my concern, that made a strong impression on me. Um, I had no idea what I could or should do about it, so I'm afraid it was just a concern that stayed in the back of my mind and I felt powerless to do anything about it. I then sort of lived a pretty normal life. I <clears throat> started working at the American Antiquarian Society when I was in high school. Because I had worked there, I was given a wonderful job at the Diamond Library at the University of New Hampshire at the reference desk. I went back to AAS for a little while, and then I got my library degree at Columbia University, and I worked in the law library. I worked very briefly for the Worcester Public Library. I worked for a long time with the most wonderful of bosses, Mr. Mahoney, James M. Mahoney, at the College of the Holy Cross. It was lovely lovely place to work. Left there to have my children and then when I went back to work part-time I was at the Worcester State University Learning Resource Center. It was around here that my marriage began to fall apart and I had to suddenly realize that the world didn't work the way that I thought it did. So I went in search of answers. I knew there was something that I was missing. I studied Reiki and aromatherapy and became certain that my job in the world was to be that of a healer. And then, oh, I have the slides a little out of order. I also ended up at Goddard Library at Clark University, and I've been here ever since. Before I started at Clark, I read this book. I found it misfiled in a bookstore, and this book changed my life. As I read it, I knew I had never heard of any of these things before, and yet it was more like being reminded of something that I'd always known rather than something I'd never heard of. I became a plant spirit medicine practitioner, and to Liz in Phoenicia, Liz, it was in Phoenicia that I learned this medicine. From, from this, I began to learn about the interconnectedness of all things, I learned to speak with plants and ask for medicine. I learned what it means to recognize the sentience and the beings of those around us. And I'm still learning to listen. I learned that we're all here to bring our gifts to the world. And just as a blade of grass is meant to be a blade of grass and not an oak tree, we are all here for our own purpose. So not everybody's going to be an oak tree and not everybody's going to be a blade of grass. If you are a being here on this planet, you have what it takes to learn to listen and communicate with, with most of the other beings here, if you so choose. I am going to take, do a little backpedaling here and say that to be respectful, I'm going to suggest to you how you can go about speaking to the beings outside of your home. I would not run off and start talking to a huge sacred mountain until you have found a teacher. But certain, I'm going to call it household, household shamanism maybe, household communication to do with the, the regular folks around you, I can teach you a little bit about how to do that. And one of the, gift, one of the important things that I want you to get from this is learning to use your gifts. Now, I will have to add that uh, one of my gifts seems to be making computers do curious things and rubbing people the wrong way. So after a lifetime of running away from conflict, I'm ready to stand here and address anything that I say that might frustrate you 
write it down and get it get back to me with your concern and we'll talk about it. So from plant spirit medicine and this course, I then went on pilgrimage with my teacher Elliot Cowan, or he, Wavia Kame is his sacred name, to a sacred site in Mexico. And this is one of his teachers, Don Jose. And this is my sacred, one of my sacred sites. I'm going to leave it on this for a little bit. One of my teachers along the way, none of the ones whom I've shown you, has spoken to me about sustainability, and he kept it very simple. He said, first of all, that there are no efforts for sustainability will work without a sacred component. And secondly, he said sustainability is a balance of community, exchange, and relationship with a strong foundation of gratitude. Gratitude is fairly straightforward. It's also enormously important. I suggest that after this talk is over, you spend a little time looking at some of the things in your life for which you can give gratitude right now. I suggest you begin doing it every day. I know that you can change the world for the better by doing that. The exchange and relationship aspect of community becomes significant when you try to nail down what is meant by community. I've read what seems like hundreds of definitions of community in preparation for this talk. I see that word as semi-porous. I'll include a slide that has a decent description for librarians about, about what community is. But my preference for now is that you chew on the exchange and relationship piece of it. There has to be some form of give and take, some form of, form of reciprocity, some form of knowing and seeing and listening and giving and receiving in order for community to exist. We see this in the natural world. One of my teachers calls the natural world the primary text. If you have a question and you can't answer it, go outside and ask nature. This is exactly what your ancestors did. The reason you're here now is because your ancestors knew this trick. So how does sacred fit into sustainability? When you look it up, I'm going to go back to my sacred site because I like that. When you look up sacred, you'll see eventually, if you go down far enough, words such as inviolable, worthy of respect, venerable. I don't know if I've taken this from someone else or not, so I can't give credit where it belongs. But I often say that without which we cannot live is something that we should respect. So water, air, soil, we all know we can't live without them. They are sacred. Acknowledge them. Einstein is credited with saying something like you can't solve a problem with the same logic that created it. So I'm choosing to remind you of the ways of your ancestors to help embrace the world from the biocentric perspective rather than the anthropocentric perspective. I'm including a link for a website with a fun tree exercise. This can help to remind you of something you already know, that you are not separate from nature. And in my version of this exercise, you speak to the tree as though you were speaking to a friend, like a friend of a friend, someone you hope to encounter again soon, and you want to make a good impression. When you're done finding your tree, I also suggest you give the tree some tobacco or cornmeal in gratitude. If you care to, you can find some many new plant studies that are showing the kind of intelligence that we have not assigned to the plant kingdom since Rene Descartes convinced us to keep things separate and that we were somehow very, very different from nature. Up until a few years ago, I was still searching for how I was to be a healer in the world, thinking that libraries could not fulfill that work for me. I chose to speak at a at a conference, a solemn conference, which is a seminar on the acquisitions of library, Latin American library materials. Their focus was on collecting materials from indigenous cultures. While preparing for that seminar, I was suddenly struck by the fact that libraries are actually living examples of community exchange and relationship. 
We are already doing this work. Liber is the only industry that I can think of that holds the value of maintaining reciprocity with our communities as one of our primary functions. The other day when I was meeting with the other Sustain RT people, we were talking about Robin Wall Kimmerer as she speaks of reciprocity, so I'm borrowing her use of the word here. We're supported by our communities, and when we are strong, we make sure our community is stronger Sorry, because of us. When we are in our power, we listen deeply to those whom we serve. Depending on the type of library you work in, that might be from the children to the elderly or departments from art to zoology. We don't collect books that just please us. We don't offer access to materials that are limited to our interests. We try to look backwards and forwards in all directions to be sure our collections reflect the needs of the many. People see us as all about the books, and when I have that, I go, hmm, if we were all about the books, would we let you take them out? No, we're here to help people grow and learn and be better citizens and to help themselves and one another. Libraries teach our people about exchange. We exchange books, ideas, seats, computers, headphones. We share lights and warmth in the physical structure. Exchange can be tricky. Some people's ideas of exchange are not the same as other people's. That's why we have to come up with rules for sharing and think about how many rules we have to have. It's because some of our people need to learn a lot about sharing. We usually have to have rules to protect those whose voices are softer or perhaps underprivileged or the masses who are good at following rules and would suffer at the hands of those who are not good at rule following. We embed relationships into everything we do. Look at cataloging. Every possible relationship one might have to a book is coded, from the arrangement of the books on the shelves to the cataloging system. And because we know that even that isn't enough, we also have reference librarians. Reference librarians and catalogers spend a lot of time and energy sorting through patterns and relationships. When I speak about librarians this way, I sometimes upset them. It's because it's in our nature to look at our patrons, our architects, our city governments as significant members of our community, and we tend not to like to separate ourselves out. Yet in truth, those of us who do this as our work have chosen to hold the promise of paying attention to as many pieces as our, of our community as we can. We have chosen to try to do the deep listening, the intuitive listening that helps us know what we are offering is what our people need. We need to put ourselves in the background to do this listening. Now, I've tried to get the measure of why we do this and why other people don't. The only explanation that works for me at the moment is E.O. Wilson's description of allele related to a spectrum that goes from selfishness to altruism. His specialties are ants and bees, but he assigns these traits to humans as well. He claims that we are all on the spectrum from selfish to altruistic, too far on either side and you wouldn't survive. I believe that most librarians fall on the altruism side. E.O. Wilson goes on to suggest that selfish people will always win over altruistic people, and groups of altruistic people will always win over groups of selfish people. That's very important for us to remember, that we're strong in groups. Something that has occurred to me last night, this is an aside, a little bit of a tangent, is that humans stopped sitting around fires about 80 or so years ago. That's about the same time that public libraries began to gain traction. So instead of sitting around fires and listening to our elders share stories of our people, we go to libraries and read the stories of many people's elders. So what I am suggesting for all of us now is that we step away from the curtain and start to show ourselves. The time for modesty has passed. We can teach our people about community. We can teach our people about exchange and relationship. And we can show the value of sharing. I've got some examples here. I believe our lives depend on this, learning to share, learning exchange, relationship, and community, and learning to share the values that we hold in these regards. So. Here are some examples of people who have learned 
some different things about sharing. This is a Westboro library in Massachusetts. It does a seed share. In some Latin American countries, it's against the law to share seeds. Now, the woman who organizes this, her gift is to organize the seed share. Somebody else might be the watchdog for the companies that decide to impose laws against seed sharing. We need both of you. Some public libraries loan people out, experts who have retired but are willing to advise people in their communities. Very creative, very interesting. Here at Clark, I talk about community all the time, and I often think that my words are falling on deaf ears. But Beth, the woman who did this slide, put the slide show together for me and has made a very beautiful job of it, has begun engaging with the students in different ways, like this Hogwarts one. And that's engendered the students to write back to us. So we now have some back and forth on the whiteboard. During the library week, she asked, why do you love your library? And look at the kinds of responses we got. Once you start speaking about community, people will hear you. They will recognize it, and they will respond. This is another example of a librarian who looked at her community and had the power to say, I know that I can keep our place open and safe for people. This Carla Hayden is the one that President Obama has pro suggested be promoted to the libra head librarian of Congress, and she's waiting for that appointment to happen. In the meanwhile, she kept her library open for what the people of her community needed during a very difficult time. And this man, Scott Bonner, the same thing for him. Librarians are willing to step up and be community leaders in unusual ways when the community needs it. I believe that we're heading towards strife of different sorts as, as nature steps in and changes things. We've already seen that in some areas, and the libraries in those communities have had to step up and begin to look after their people in other ways. This is going to be taxing for us. Some people are very good at sharing and others are not, and we need to be strong in who we are. I personally don't believe that there's any new technology that will use no new resources require no advertising, no packaging, no transportation, and be freely available to everyone that will come and save us. I believe we must use what we have and be who we are. My request of you is to look at yourself. What are you good at? What interests you? What gifts can you bring? It doesn't have to be the big and obvious thing. It can be smaller and seemingly less significant, like an ant gift. With the non-human community, community, begin by thanking them. Thank those trees every single day as you walk by for the oxygen that they have given to you today. And then, after you've begun listening to them, go back and try to sense and listen to what your human community needs are. Find at least one thing, and it can be small, but find it and do it. I'm convinced that once you start to speak with your trees and the grass and the spaces around you and begin to listen to the humans around you differently, you'll hear all of these voices in a new way. The Lakota like to say, o yasin, all my relations. I am related to everything. For those of you who are not yet ready to embrace non-humans as communicators, look to, let's see... Aldo Leopold's land ethic. This stops shy of giving them sentience, yet is profound. And my final, well, not quite my final slide. This is a slide, um, as I was reading about community, I just loved this phrase, the fruit and root of the community. In 1944, Mrs. Martha Sebastian was the head librarian of the Greensboro Carnegie Negro Library. And in her annual report, she called that her library the fruit and root of the community. Sounds like many beautiful things happened in that library. This is not as exciting a slide as I had hoped. I had applied for a position at WPI 
or sustainability coordinator, mostly to be a little bit of a nudge. They asked for somebody, the original job description, and I've, I lost that and I can't get it back, um, was looking for somebody who could assess what resources were on the campus, find out what people could share, communicate with all levels within the campus to say, this is what we have and here's how you can share it. I want you to realize that what we do is considered very important now. And, you know, we may not be sustainability coordinators, but we certainly work well with them. Here's my bibliography. I'm going to ask you to forgive me for errors in it. I've tried to get it as accurate as possible. Um, but I get tired of picky stuff after a while, so this is it. All right, thank you. I'm done. Okay, uh, I, I hope people can hear me. I'm talking. In any case, we uh, we want to invite people to type in their questions or comments, and we're, we'll be watching the uh, chat column here. Uh, so thank you so much, Rachel. That was wonderful. I, I would also like to mention that we've recorded this and we'll be uh, sending out a link to the recording uh, at, in, in the next day or so, as well as a, uh, a survey asking for feedback on the webinar. Uh, so uh, lots of thanks to uh, being sent uh, to Rachel. I am so pleased. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Really, I know I ended rather abruptly because I was worried about the time, and I wanted to stay within the time frame. But thank you for listening. I'm really, really grateful to all of you. Lots of good ideas for things to read and follow up on. And if you haven't seen uh, Rachel's TEDx talk, uh, I think we linked it at one point in some of the promotional materials. It, is it in your bibliography, Rachel? Yes, it is. Okay, great. And I, I will happily take emails as well if people want to talk more about anything. You know, we can share broadly or narrowly. And I'm just going to go back to my favorite slide, which is my sacred site. This, she is so very beautiful to me. All right. And I also, while we're waiting, and just waiting, um, applaud you for the good work you're already doing. Every single one of you who's here is thinking about how to make things better. That's That's a huge beginning. I don't... I... Don't know that I uh, should. It, you know, I'm, I'm not typing my notes in, or my question or comment in, but I'll say that I recently uh, listened to a recording or interview with uh, Naomi Ruth Remen. Uh, she's a, an MD and she uh, has a program called Commonweal in California. But uh, her description of uh, the, and others would be more uh, knowledgeable about this, of Tikkun, Tikkun Alam, uh, the Jewish Kabbalah uh, concept, has the same uh, idea that we all can do a little bit, even if it's just a small thing. And I, I really appreciate how you commented on that as well, uh, Rachel. Well, and many traditions speak of... Um Oh, I, I Rachel had the, Ruth. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I got the name wrong. <laughs> the, uh, many traditions speak of the original instructions, and there are peoples all over the world who've received original instructions, and when you bring them together, the base of them, the foundation, is very, very much the same. So there will be, you know, follow your heart, for where you might want to read and, and learn. And that's an important thing I forgot to say, is following your heart, is that is going to help you with your listening, not your mind, but your heart. And you will find just what you need to read and do.
to work towards sustainability. And it looks like our time is up. Thank you. Okay. I, I don't know how to end you. this. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry. I see. Thanks, uh, Madeline, for the correction on pronunciation. And uh, I do see a comment real quick here. Uh, uh, maybe you can address this in some emails back to us, but uh, a little bit more about your teachers. Uh, um, well, the one I don't have a picture of the one I'm working with now, and I'm sorry for that. His name is Tom Balistreri, and he is the lo- man I am studying with the Lakota tradition in. Um, and I, I mean, he's in Massachusetts, which is very unusual. Um, and I, anyone who wants his address, I can connect you to him. And the the other people, the Weichel, the people with from whom I learned the Weichel ways. Um, there's a place called the Blue Deer Center in. Um, I remember it normally. It's in Margaretville, New York. And they, my teacher there, Elliot Cowan, leads people um, in learning ways of the of various traditions. The well, the center leads people in various ways. Elliot leads only in the Weichel tradition. Okay, so, uh, well, actually, I, now I'm seeing another. Uh, I think I think we're pretty much done, and uh, I think we've got the uh, any questions we'll, that we didn't catch. We'll uh, make sure to send to Rachel, and and she can uh, put some things together if we need to. So again, we'll be sending the uh, recording out and a survey. And again, thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye.